Well, good morning. How's my family this morning? My little Christmas family out here? Hey, can you feel the excitement this morning going on? It's, we're all getting excited here for tonight's event. We know it's one of our, if not our largest outreach of the year, and we're really looking forward to it. So I hope you're all excited about that, and I hope you'll be here to attend and enjoy it with us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning just thankful and humble in all ways. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to be here to be in praise and worship to you. Father, I pray that you just come in and sit among us, that your presence be felt throughout this building. Father, that the message brought this morning is your message, not mine. Just move me over out of the way, hide me behind the cross as you speak. And Father, we pray for this event tonight, Father. We do pray that uh, we uh, glorify you and everything we do tonight, that it would be about you and not about us. Father, we love you, we praise you, we give all the glory to you. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Well, we are just 15 days, actually 14 days as of today, uh, from Christmas Day. It's gotten here that quick. It seems like summer just fell away and all at once we're at Christmas. And I would guess that we have all seen that greatly successful movie, It's a Wonderful Life, that has already been playing for several weeks now. Now, I had somebody, Mark Lombach, said he has never watched that movie. I, you know, he's led, led a sheltered life or something. I don't know how that works. But, you know, I, it's played so much, and we've had the opportunity every year. And, you know, and I would even go to go on to guess that, Almost everyone has watched the movie at some point in their lives, Mark. But, uh, you know, if you haven't, you may not know much about it. But this uh, past uh, week, I watched a show where Mike Rowe, if you know who Mike Rowe is, he's the Dirty Jobs guy, if you've ever watched that. Very intelligent gentleman, down to earth, just as much as you could be. He's one of us. And he shared some eye-opening information about that movie's inception. He mentioned that when the movie was first released in, in the 1940s, it was a box office failure. The film received mixed reviews from critics, and although it was nominated for five Academy Awards, it received just one, and that was for the technical achievement from the gentleman that had learned to use make snowflakes and make snow look really realistic. That's... The only, that's the only uh, award that it had won. And the film was quickly forgotten not long after that, and it sat in hibernation for over three decades. Then after a clerk forgot to renew its copyright, which was only $10 at the time, It's a Wonderful Life grew a life of its own. No longer was it hindered by copyright laws and entering the public domain where anyone could share the film, the public's admiration for the film grew with every free tele television and radio broadcast until it became what it is today. It's a Christmas tradition, amen? Interesting stuff that he shared. The film reveals how every once in a while, everyone receives a gift that they're really not sure they want. Now, you're going to say, hey, man, I've watched the movie over and over again, and you probably have. I like it. It's got to be in black and white. It's got to be everything. All the old movies, uh, Miracle on 34th Street, they all got to be in black and white to me, or otherwise I don't watch them. You know, I guess that's how old school I am. But, you know, the and, and I know you don't need to know the whole concept of the movie. So we're going to give you the Reader's Digest condensed version to lead where we're going this morning. In the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey, who was the main character, and he, it was played by actor James Stewart, had a gift that he wasn't sure he wanted. His gift was the gift of life. And his life had seemingly fallen apart all around him. He just knew he was going to lose his business and his livelihood. Now, I'm leaving some space in there, so if you haven't watched the movie, Mark that you will go fill in those blanks at that time. 
He faced prison for something he hadn't done. And as a result of all this, his family faced shame and poverty. In desperation, he pleads with his arch enemy, Mr. Potter, the bank officer there at the time in Bedford Falls. And he pleads with him for a loan on his life insurance because all George actually had for collateral was his life insurance, which was $500 at the time. Rather, George, he was basically to the point where he was ready to sell his soul to evil. He just couldn't take it anymore. It was gotten that, that bad and that low that he was ready to give up. And Mr. Potter, he gleefully, excitedly says, George, you're worth more dead than alive. Boy, did that get his attention. This is where George decides that his only solution is to throw himself off a bridge and into the frigid waters below and kill himself. This way, at least, it'll supply his family with the money from his life insurance that they'll need to move forward. The great part of the show, the show is when God steps in, though, and sends an angel to earth to stop George before he can take his own life. The question here for anyone would be, how do you convince a person that the gift they want to throw away is in, real, in reality too valuable to be destroyed? How do you convince someone of that when they get at their lowest point? And as Christians, we witness that through people every day. We see those type of things. So how do we convince them that their life is worth more? The angel's solution was to grant George's wish and show him what life would have been like if he had never been born. This all caused George to struggle. The whole time he's being shown everything, he struggled while trying to get back to his home. And it reveals to him in the process that the town he'd worked so hard to build up and protect had become a den of sin and evil. His brother Harry, whom he'd saved from falling through the ice while they were ice skating on a lake, dies because George wasn't there to save him, which in turn caused hundreds of men to die that Harry would have saved during the war because Harry wasn't there to save them either. The pharmacist who George saved from a tragic mistake has become the town drunk because of that mistake, because George wasn't there to stop him. The beautiful woman that he had married and had wonderful children with ended up becoming a dejected, lonely librarian. And after much of a struggle, George finally understand how wonderful his life had been. He was allowed the opportunity to see how much would have been lost if he'd never been born. The life that he had been tempted to throw away was revealed to be the life that was too valuable to lose. George had an opportunity that most people don't get. But if we reflect on what the movie really means, is how valuable is your life? When you sit here today and think, hey, I'm just mediocre, I'm just, you know, I'm just another person in a, in a seat out here. It's not true. God believes you're more than that. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is writing to the Christians who had been tempted also to throw away their gifts. Before they had become Christians, these Ephesians had been Gentiles and pagans. They had also become dead in their transgressions and sins making them objects of wrath. So if you join me this morning, we're in the Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. i got to get this right. Courtney's here today. Ephesians chapter 2, unit verse 1. But I don't have my glasses, so if I mess up, I got an excuse, Courtney. 
As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. When you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us... <clears throat> All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transition. It is by grace you have been saved. Paul's actually saying that are trying to overcome where false teachers had came into their town and was telling them that what God had done through Jesus Christ wasn't enough. They were teaching that it really didn't matter that Jesus had been born. False teachers trying to change everything in their minds, just like our world's trying to do today. Satan runs among us. And he's trying to do the same thing. Say, hey, Jesus isn't that important. His birth wasn't that important. If they could do away with Christmas altogether in this country, it would happen. Too many Christians. Too strong. You ever wonder why? Well, what would our world be like if Jesus was never born and Christmas never happened? What would our world be like? Well, there'd be no more winter family gatherings that we have, nothing to look forward to as the days get shorter and the thermostats fall. We don't get to look forward to that anymore. No Christmas gifts or Christmas trees and no Christmas cheer. No Christmas holiday traditions, no Christmas carols, and no Christmas decorations. I had this little survey that I pulled out, and it's about what people think of Christmas. What do people believe about the birth of Christ? This is a poll that was done and the questions about Christ and his birth. Here are some of the results when that was asked. 67% believe that, believe that the entire story of Christmas is historically accurate. 24% believe the story of Christmas is a theological invention. If Jesus had never been born, people believe there would be 63% less charity, 61% less kindness, 59% less personal happiness, 58% less tolerance, 47% more war, 38% less religious divisions. Maybe you think that everyone in church believes the right things in this church and every other church. Well, maybe, but maybe not. Hopefully, we're reaching people who believe the wrong things and sharing what the right things are. Without Christmas, December 25th would be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, as quoted by a small boy named Ralphie in the Christmas Story movie, which was all about a Red Rider BB gun. For sure, if there had never been the birth of Jesus or no Christmas, the world would be far different than it is today and in ways we could never imagine. Chaos everywhere. But when Jesus showed up, he taught his followers to love God and their neighbors. Then they organized efforts to help those who were dying or in need. They built staffed and paid for holidays. I'm sorry, for hospitals. Oh, glasses. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ followers have founded virtually every charitable organization on earth. Think about that. Have founded virtually every charitable organization on earth of all the organizations there are. Without the birth of Christ, our education today would be very different also. Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, and almost every one of the first 123 American colleges and universities were founded by Christians. Hard to see that today, isn't it? Hard to believe that those schools now teach evolution and deny the very existence of God 
were started as Christian universities. What a change. If there had never been the birth of Jesus or the celebrating of Christmas because of the birth of Jesus, much of the good in this world would be missing today. I'm sure we all have a good Christmas memory of some kind. If we just stop to think about it this morning, which Christmas memory would stand out to you this morning that you'll never forget? I'm sure each one of you have one. Well, without Christmas, that never happened for any of us. The main thing, though, is without Christmas, something far worse would have happened. Christ would not have come, and there would be no hope. No hope at all for our future or nothing to live for. As Christians, we don't even want to think about life without the birth of Jesus. Amen? What would that be like? John chapter 1, verse 1. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. A world of darkness and evil would not be something we would all want for our lives. Amen? The importance of the birth of Jesus Christ, the importance of our faith believing in the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the fundamentals of our lives. A life without it can be a struggle. You know, I don't know where George was in the midst of this. Never in the show did it mention that George had called on God. But God shoved the angel in his path to change his thinking, to change the way he looked at life and the things that happened. You can all be that angel, especially this season. You can be that person that intervenes in someone else's life that can change their outlook and the way they look at life and lead them to know our mighty Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, this morning I pray that you're encouraged to thank God for the gift of life he has given you, each and every one of you. Also to consider how other lives would have been impacted if not for your life that may have touched and changed the course of someone else's life. It's the ripple effect. You never know. Sometimes we do. But you never know the life you can touch or change with a kind word or a kind gesture that you reflect Jesus Christ through you to someone else. The lives that can be touched. You see through this movie of all the things that could go horribly wrong if George was just not born. Same applies to each and every one of us. God tells us he knows us intimately. He knows every hair on our head. So he knows you so well He puts you here for a purpose. You have to figure out that purpose. But I'll tell you this. One purpose is is to share the message of his love to everyone you come in contact with. To change lives. To help him walk through this world and change lives for for the better for many people that struggle today. We should cheerfully celebrate the Christmas holidays. Because of the birth of Jesus Christ. Who came to this earth as a simple human. And endured so much scorn and ridicule while he was here. A man who went through so much pain and suffering on the cross for us. So that we might be forgiven for our sins. And enjoy a better life here on earth. And an eternal life in heaven with him.
Why was it important that Jesus did not throw his life away? Well, we have so many different reasons. The Bible's full of those reasons that we're thankful that he didn't just throw his life away and say, hey, all this stuff going on between the scorn, the ridicule, the way people receive me, all that going on, hanging on the cross, the whole deal. What if Jesus said, hey, I'm not doing any of that. I'm not dying for people that don't care about me at all. Today, search your heart. How much do you love and care about Jesus Christ and having him in your life? This is a season. If you want to reflect Jesus Christ, the Bible says it's not about us. It's all about the other. God's placed you here this morning for a reason. But he's also placed you in his path to be a servant and a guide to others that struggle through life. In today's society, so many suicides so many desperations, people turning to drugs and alcohol, leaving their families, just bailing out, thinking their life is worthless. Well, the Bible tells us Jesus loves us so much that there's not one life that's worthless. There's not one person here this morning that he doesn't love. If you think you have so much sin in your life from your past, Jesus doesn't see what's behind you. He's looking for what's in front of you. Be something, be a light. For someone else. Why was it important that Jesus did not throw, his, throw away his gift? John's 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish. But have eternal life. For God did not send his son. Verse 17. Into the world to condemn the world. But to save it through him. Today. Everywhere you go. Every morning you get up or you go to bed all day long, thank God. Thank God for the life you have as a gift from God. And don't be ashamed to say Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Father God, once again we come to you, Father. We're just thankful that we're able to be here this morning being praise and worship to you, Father. We're thankful for all the blessings you pour out here on your church house and this church family. Father, we just pray for good things to come. Father, we once again pray for the event tonight. We pray for all the volunteers that have just stepped up and just flooded us this year in a helpful way that they are willing to be servants for you. Father, I pray tonight through everything we've done today and tonight that it might touch someone else's life. It might change the course and direction of their life that they might grow closer to you. Father, let us be that vessel. Let us be that light for you. Father, we love you. We praise you. I pray everything we did, everything we said here today was pleasing, uplifting, and glorifying to you. And we ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.